and this is just tame. He go, flies at the front door, and he will pick up a six by nine rug and shake it like it's a towel. We want a golden retriever in a Rottweiler's body. I'm not ready for this. I can't handle this situation right now. So with Duke, it's going to be, um, I think normal stranger danger type stuff, right? As far as people coming up to him and him being a little bit reactive. How old is he right now? <laughs> He's about five and a half. Okay. He right. keeps telling we have our it feels five, like 15 yeah. years, yeah. but yeah. he's between. <laughs> okay, we'll say between four and five. We play it safe. Um, Overall goals, I think I was thinking about this coming over here and what you just said. It's that we can be more comfortable together in more places. We spend a lot of time in Colorado and we're on the trails a lot. We kind of have to hide, you know, and, and pick our times when we go on the trails. So just overall having, having a better relationship. And it's taken us about five years to actually have a good relationship with him. I mean, like. Yeah, we were close to having to do something different, right? So it seems to me it's like overall control. Not every dog has to be, you know, the golden retriever we see on TV that can go up to anybody at any time and whatever. Like that, I, that's not realistic at all, in my opinion. Sometimes you get a unicorn dog and they're great with everybody and everything, and that's good. But it's not realistic to have the uh, assumption and or uh, I guess expectation of every dog that we have to be like that. So if you have a dog that has a little bit of stranger danger and doesn't really like affection from people they don't know, that makes perfect sense to me. I don't find any problem with that. But I think that the important thing is, is making sure, again, you guys can control him and so that way you can live your life and do the things that you want to do with him without having to sacrifice some of the things like cutting off the trail 20 yards that way or maybe there's too too many people here we might leave but but the other thing is is having the expectation of reality and being fair to not only the people around you but him as well because because of his potential genetical things that are going on meaning he's never going to like x or y or z that just means that you guys have to, I don't want to say lower the bar, but you have to be realistic. And I think we're, we're cool with that. I guess I'd ask, we can walk down a path, right? With him on a leash and people are coming towards us and maybe we have to move to the side, but we can walk past each other comfortably. Yes, okay. but is it depends also on the other dog. If we're walking and we pull off to the side, you know, from me to the wall away and they come over and their dog goes, bing, and then he has a problem with that. No, that's not reasonable, but it's not reasonable for any dog. So yes, within reason, it's all reasonable and fair, given the circumstances that the other dog and the other person is going to be fair. All right, you guys, so Duke, large Rottweiler, very powerful. Some of the things that they're working on is reactivity to strangers, having some stranger danger issues. They can't have people over to their house. Uh, they feel uncomfortable walking him out in public spaces when there's other dogs around. They hike a lot and they travel. They're from Chicago, but they, they travel a lot in Colorado and do a lot of hiking and, and trail riding. And so it's important for them to be able to enjoy their dog uh, while they're out in public in these spaces. And right now, they do not feel comfortable bringing him anywhere because of his reactivity and because of his leash skills are not where they need to be. So one of the first things I do with every single dog I work with, as you guys know, is let me see where your leash pressure is. If you come in with a behavioral case or you come in with a reactivity case on the leash, I need to see where you're at with your dog in the beginning. So as you saw when Duke came in, he's pulling all over the place. He's to the left, he's to the right. He's really not engaged too much. And maybe some of the equipment they're using isn't gonna be really what they need to control this massive, powerful dog. So things that I'm noticing off the bat is engagement. So I want him to be more engaged with you. I want him to be paying attention to you a little bit more. It's okay that he's sniffing if he's on his break and it's okay that he's not engaged on his break. But when you're working with him, there were a couple times where he did look at you in the heel, which is great. It's not gonna probably be scalable and sustainable when there's distractions, right. which is something that everybody deals with because it's level one obedience versus level, let's say four to five obedience. The other thing is, is uh, holding him accountable for the behaviors that you're asking him. So when you ask him to sit, it's not put his butt on the ground for five seconds and then get up. So I want you to just heel him forward and then stop and then ask him to sit, hold that sit, and then you can start working on your break. So when he gets back up, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, you're just gonna give him a little bit of pressure just like that. Good. 
what you'll do now is you'll just tell them break and you'll, yep, perfect, perfect, perfect. Let's continue to do that a little bit more. I'm just gonna start adding in a little bit of distraction now. Good. So you could tell them good sit. Good sit. Very good. Wonderful, cool. Now um, just give them a little break. It's good. Good boy. So this is like going to the mechanic and saying, I swear the car makes this noise all the time <laughs> oh, yeah. and then it doesn't. <laughs> Happens every, every time. So that's why we do this program the way that we do is because later today you're going to have, you know, other dogs around yeah. and they may be bigger than him. They may be smaller than him. They be, may, may be reactive. They may be, you know, so it'll be, it'll be realistic. So this is where I struggle because okay. when he's not, Healing like this, which is most he, of the time on the walk, he's just a little bit ahead. I see that. Stop right there and then use your leash pressure. Yep, pressure back. Don't ask him to sit. Just a little bit of pressure back. There you go. See? So like a horse, you put pressure back and his back legs are going to start moving. Now to reposition him a little bit more is you can take a little step forward. Boom. Now you're in position again. But keep in mind that as soon as he moves forward, you give him pressure. So I'm going to move this dog around again and I want you to practice just keeping him into that position because he's so used to kind of flying all over the place. Pull back, not up on the leash. Right, yes. Because okay. if you pull up, he's likely going to want to sit. sit. Yeah. yeah, if you pull back, he's going to, usually, usually dogs will just kind of slide into position. If he's in front of you, technically, I mean, in a, in a, he's a first responder. He's like, I'll handle this. But if he's behind you, and that's what we're working on here, is you want to keep your body position as kind of a power stance of like, hey, I got this. So whatever the distraction is in front of us, you want the dog to be here. And this is how you want to handle it. But if he's here and he's sniffing and he's forging forward, you automatically take a back seat and say, yeah, dude, handle it. I don't know what to do. Does it do him harm if he does see a dog and goes bananas? No, and, and in fact, if he leaves here right now and he sees a dog and goes to bananas, I, I don't care about that at all. I'm looking so macro that I, because of the success we just had here, I don't care about that reaction because we haven't worked on it yet. It, it wouldn't be unlikely. It wouldn't be regression. It wouldn't be, holy crap, this is completely different because this is all according to plan. He is building exactly the way he should. So once we start dipping into those distractions and we start integrating heavier distractions, we're gonna, like, just like this, like we're gonna handle it when it happens and we'll figure out what's gonna be best. But if I can get to know him through you guys watching him work and watching you guys work with him, I know what he's gonna be ready for because of my experience working with these dogs. If you're not prepared to handle the situation when it happens inevitably, I would just avoid and get out. I'm not ready for this. I can't handle this situation right now. A lot of times what people do is they dig a, a bigger hole. I don't want you to avoid if you have the ability to handle it and he has the know-how to handle it. But if you're in a situation where you've never you know, played uh, rugby and you're like, I'm gonna walk out with the pros and you get yeah. annihilated, you're like, maybe I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I'm not ready for that yet. So with him, I, I can tell you that I haven't walked you through and I don't know what he's capable of. I don't know what his triggers are yet uh, necessarily. So I'm not going to expect much out of him right now. If there's a dog out here, which I'm sure there is, waiting to come in for the next session, I would just say, hey, we're gonna go over here instead and we will hit that and we will go through that. You will be walking past dogs that he doesn't know for sure inside and outside this weekend, but right now you're not ready for that. So I just tell people, don't dig a deeper hole because when you're ready to hit it and you're ready to work on it, he's already got, he's already got your number. Because mm -hmm. you're like, oh, mm -hmm. I have maybe we, oh, I have the prong collar on and there's another dog and I get reactive and these are the things that I do already. You don't want to dig that hole and that groove down even more. But moving forward from here, after this weekend, you guys will have a really good idea on how to handle it, so that won't be a problem anymore. All right, you guys just wrapped up some cool training with our out-of-states. My friend Mike Jones from Primal Canines here at the new facility doing a bite seminar. Let's go check it out. Some dogs become very, let's say, bratty when you try to put on equipment. Sometimes it's because they just frankly don't like being told what they can and can't do. 
Sometimes they're picky about what is put on them. Sometimes they have pre-existing like PTSD of like putting on equipment, who knows? But what you wanna do when you're putting on equipment and the dog is a little iffy with it is you desensitize it over time. So take your time, put a thing of treats in your hand and let the dog come up to whatever piece of equipment you're putting on and over time kind of put it on as you go. So t the biggest thing I would say is Duke really doesn't like equipment, um, but he's doing really good with them here. But if you guys are working with that at home, take your time and desensitize the equipment over time, just a little bit out of a time with less usage of it or no usage of it at all until the dog is really comfortable with it. Now, surprisingly enough, they came all the way from Chicago to New York to work with me with leash reactivity and Duke really hasn't reacted at all. Now this is actually unfortunately normal for some reactive dogs because you got to remember, we're taking him completely out of his space. We're taking him out of his comfort zone. We're taking him out of his neighborhood and we're putting him into an environment that he's never been in. And frankly, he probably just doesn't care about. So when we think about these things, what I try to do is why? Okay, he's reactive at home to a point where we're gonna come all the way here to work on it. Um, and so why is it different? Why is he not reactive? Those are the things that are running through my mind as I'm working with him and the owners. And one of the biggest things is, is it could be a resource guarding issue. It could be a protective thing. And like I said in the video, a lot of times when, when dogs are reactive in their neighborhood, you have to think that the dogs are m mainly reactive or more reactive in their neighborhood and in the car and in the house because they claim it as theirs. So that could be one of the biggest contributing factors to why Duke is so reactive at home is because maybe he has insecurity issues or protective issues. The reason why dogs historically and normally are more reactive in their own neighborhoods is because you gotta think like when a dog goes out and they're peeing and marking and sniffing on everything, you guys are thinking like, oh, that's the Johnson's and that's the Smith's house and that's, dogs don't look at it like that. When they go out for a walk every day in the same neighborhood, that is their neighborhood. Dogs are a little bit different. So he's gonna be more reactive in your neighborhood because it's also, he thinks it's his neighborhood. Sure. Especially if you're dealing with a very like pushy, confident um, dog, you know? So yeah. And same it, thing in the car. Even in the car. That's yeah. what I was just wondering. Exactly. As soon as we get out of the neighborhood, he's like, exactly. whatever. So, you're, so, so then you gotta pinpoint it like, okay, what does that tell you? That tells you that it could be a possession thing, could be a resource guarding thing. Let that information tell you to say, if his behavior is not so consistent, that gives you a good opportunity to isolate the variables of why these triggers are happening. I'm gonna grab my dog for a second and I'll show you like a very binary black and white break and work, work and play anyway. So I'll ask her to heal. And my expectation of healing is going to be her at my heels, no matter if I back up or I turn or I back up and turn, I want her to stay right here. Now, <clears throat> if I take the ball in my hand and I throw it, she's still to be here, no matter what I do, because I asked her to heal. She's not out of this position until I release her. Does that make sense? So she's in a gear, right? So this is what she has to do, although obviously it's clear what she really wants to do, which is go after that B-A-L-L, -L, okay? Makes sense? So now if I wanted to do a different behavior, sit, good. Left, place, break. So you see how compartmentalized it is? There's no questions, there's no confusion. When they're doing break, a lot of you guys kind of have seen the break before, but when you're doing break, you're really, you're still trying to figure out what it's going to look like. And that's really what it looks like. So with her, like on her break, I'm gonna go over here and this is her break. <laughs> so I never really have to worry about what she's doing on her break because this is the type of dog she is. So how do you turn her off then? You don't, she doesn't okay. have an off switch. Okay. Her off switch would be putting her back in there and she'll lay down until it's her time to work again. Or she'll go, hey, you look fun and she'll bring the ball to her, which she's on her break. What so, about at home though? I mean, what does she do at home then? She's always on? Yeah. Okay. She lays down and she'll relax when it's relaxed time. But for the most time, she's like, can we play? 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 <laughs> so, but again, like, house. I could go touch. Cush it. Now I can spend three or four hours working, eating dinner, bringing in groceries, throwing 10 balls around, and she's not going to move. So my obedience controls the beast. And I tell people that if your obedience is good, it doesn't matter if your dog is a man eater or the most energetic crazy dog in the world. If you can say, hey, go there and go there now, they're like, okay, good, it doesn't matter. So obedience plays a huge role because we can get 
all these dogs walking around, she's not gonna move. And even if we have two dogs there, two dogs here, and two dogs here, if I give her the B word, she's gonna hit the ball and she's gonna come to me because that's the type of dog she is. So I just wanted to show you like some of that obedience demonstration that if you have good obedience and you have good understanding of what means what, you can literally like remote control your dog to do the things that you want them to do on leash or off. If you guys don't know about the No Bad Dog Members Club, it's a 1999 subscription-based service. You guys are getting the full-length videos that you see here on YouTube. This is gonna be a 15, 20-minute video. The full-length video is an hour. You're getting the seminars. You're getting the No Bad Dog Army community. We are helping each other out. We're empowering each other. We're not punching down. We're not making fun of, we're not judging. It's a really special thing, and I'm so happy and grateful to be a part of it. Click the link below to join the official No Bad Dog Members Club. Okay, so all you'll do is uh, bring him around and then ask him to sit and I'll use the e-collar for the first time. We'll see what that looks like. He doesn't, he doesn't like the little Duke's it. antennas. Good, good. And then uh, heel again. Duke heel. Good, so that I just used it there both times. Turn around again and then a SIT. Duke's it. Pressure on, release. So as soon as his butt hits the ground, I release my finger. Now when this is on, it's going tap, 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 tap. So he just barely feels it. What that does is it's an association. It's a, it's a conditioning thing that I am still mastering. You could get so creative with the stimulation and how the dog responds, it's very exciting. But I almost associate it like a clicker in, in some degree where the dog associates that sound and in this case, it would be a sensation with either a reward or a cue of some sort. We ask a dog to do something, click, treat, click, treat, click, treat, click, where's the treat? It's a conditioning thing, right? With the e-collar stimulation, it's kind of similar to that, to where at this level, we're holding the e-collar down when we ask him to do something. He feels this, he goes, what do you want? You, want, you must want something, because this is on. It's gonna take a couple days for him to register, this is you, this is you, this is you, this is you. Two weeks down the road, we get a long line out, just like we did yesterday with Mav. I say, Duke, come. And he's like, whoa, from over here you can, yeah, I can touch you anywhere with this. He's off leash, the long line's dragging, he's over there, I say, Duke, come, he's like, Woohoo! He turns that on and he comes sprinting to me and, and, and he, he gets paid. So it would be like if you were facing that way and I tapped you on the shoulder, the moment you turned around, I would stop tapping because I got your attention. What some people do is they come over, whack, and they whack you. You're like, what the hell, man? You suck. And that's what they do with the e-collar. I'm not saying my way is right. I just am trying to use it in a very creative way. And I've kind of taken pieces from the Monk Sanuski, Michael Ellis, Forrest Mickey, Tyler Muto, uh, a lot of my friends, and I'm watching what they're doing and I'm constantly growing with it. And it, it's getting better, it's getting really cool. Now the pager is going to be when he, I call that intervention. So you're only using that in oh crap. But like now, for example, right? When we get in the car and go, some, go drive around, if yeah. he starts going mental in the car, should we try it? Good question. It gets a little dicey because you're either doing it in intervention mode and you're not interested in using stimulation long term or you're doing stimulation, making sure he understands it, and then you can use both intervention correction. So there's a correction for portion of the e-collar that's going to be either done. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So right so, now, if you guys are doing just stimulation and you're trying to, do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get it? No correction. But then if you go and you use it as a correction, he's like, wait a minute, that's different. I don't like using the stimulation as a correction on any dog. If a dog comes in losing it, the only time I'll ever correct it with an e-collar without context is in an intervention stage with the pager. If I use the stimulation as a correction and you're like, everything is you know modified and we're good and now you're like, okay, now I want to use the stimulation as, as obedience, the dog might get conflicted with that. Okay, so we're on leash. He's got a knee collar on, he's got a prong collar on. You see a dog coming, he starts to build. Duke heal yeah. with a stimulation, Yeah. right? And he's healing nicely. We're good, right? If he stops that heel, then boost. You're replacing everything you would do on the leash with the e-collar at that point. So you could use the boost for whatever you want. I think you should just manually work with him on his healing and his obedience with the prong for right now and then using the e-collar as stimulation and introduction phases. So two weeks down the road, when you get into the car and he's got only positive things to say about the e-collar, then you use the pager, he's gonna be like, oh, okay, I get it. Some dogs are more sensitive to the pager and that could be your oh crap button and I wouldn't use it for jumping on the counter. I wouldn't use it for maybe not healing. I would only use it for that high intense reactivity 
in the back of the car or if he's reactive to other dogs. So Duke came in with severe reactivity. He didn't react while he was here. Like any dog that I work with here uh, in the facility, they're usually here for two and a half days. So it doesn't mean he's gonna go home and he's fixed or he's gonna go home and he's never gonna react again. That's not our expectations or reality at all. But really what these programs are working with me is empowerment and confidence and showing people what their dog is capable of and what, what their dog could be if maybe they just thought a little bit differently or they have the confidence of being around somebody like myself who professionally works with dogs. So when they came in, they were like, man, it's really bad. You know, we thought about euthanizing him. We thought about getting him away. We just didn't know what to do. And as you can see, it doesn't matter if he's not doing it here because he's not comfortable here or whatever, is he has the potential to be the dog that they want him to be if you do the right things. So huge pr progress with Duke and the owners. I'm very, very, very excited for them. I just hope when they go home, they continue to do the things that we've done here and take control. Because in my opinion, Duke really isn't uh, aggressive or reactive. We didn't see any of that. I think he's just a dog that maybe needs some advocacy. And of course, when you come in with a piece of equipment that can't control the dog, the dog is all over the place. And it's really less about the equipment and more about the control. And so moving forward, I think just having that basic control and introducing the e-collar over time is gonna be huge for them. So I thank everybody for watching this video. And of course, like this video, subscribe to the channel, turn on your notification bells, all that fun stuff if you haven't yet. We put videos out like this every single week and we'll talk to you next time. I think that Tom connected a lot of dots for us. We know he, ne he needs obedience, but we didn't really know that obedience was the foundation to correcting his reactivity problems. Tom gave us tools to use at home in a way we could understand. He communicates very well. It was well worth spending the weekend.